is where Daniel chapter 3, and we're reading the whole of the chapter. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth six cubits. He set it up on the plain of Jura in the province of Babylon. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the councillors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the councillors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, all the peoples, the nations, and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, the harp, the bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you, They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, If you are ready when you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, the harp, the bagpipe, and every kind of music to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, We have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God, who we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. And he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the burning fiery furnace. Because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated, The flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace. (coughs) Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counsellors, Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. He answered and said, But I see four men, unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace 
he declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not any power over the bodies of these men. The hairs of their heads were not singed. Their cloaks were not harmed. No smell of fire had come upon them. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants, who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree. Any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb, their houses laid in ruins. For there is no other god who is able to rescue in this way. Then the king promised, uh, promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. So reads the word of God. Wouldn't you have liked to have been there, a fly on the wall? Uh, good morning to you all. It's lovely to be with you. Hope that you had a pleasant Christmas time and uh, that the new year has come in happily for you. That may not be the case for you. And I pray that God, in his grace, will reach out in his mercy and give you his peace for whatever might be troubling your life, even into this new year. Uh, thankfully, uh, part of my enjoyment of teaching Daniel chapter 3 to you is that I will thoroughly enjoy teaching Daniel 3 to you. Whether you actually enjoy it or not is another matter. But that's on you, not me. Well, maybe it is on me too. Thankfully, I don't have to try to sort out the bagpipe issue. <laughs> if you're a Scot, that will be great. <laughs> there were bagpipes there, or were they? Well, we don't know. Uh, there was a lot of instruments, we know. But anyway, the bagpipes are not central to the whole issue. Let us pray. But what is to be central, Father? Son and Holy Spirit is you. So we say to you, Triune God, don't stay on the periphery of us, of our service now. Thank you fully. You've been present with us as we have sung, as we've entered into the reading of Scripture, as we have prayed. Yes, you've been central in all of that. But we want you to be equally as central now. Jesus, we do not wish you to be on the periphery. Spirit, we want you to take up your truth and give us ears to hear and hearts to believe. In Jesus' name. Amen. The heat reveals who is really being worshipped. Yes, we would like to be a fly on the wall, wouldn't we? In this incredible uh, incident. But I'm not sure I'd fancy a furious king and a furious blazing furnace and stand before it and say, I believe God and I'm not going to worship your gods. The heat, you see, really reveals who is being worshipped within our lives in the private realm, in the daily existence, wherever that takes us. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are not famous football players who were celebrated as great. They were not the Elon Musk of their day and part of the rich elite, though they certainly had high-powered jobs. They were not skilled musicians who performed to thousands of adoring fans on the bagpipes. They were, not, they were not cultural influencers with millions of followers. They were not justice warriors who lived to save the planet. In fact, actually, they were nobodies in the wider history. And yet within this chapter, they are mentioned at least 12, maybe 14 times. Shadrach, Meshach, 
and Abednego. They were men who lived for God in their everyday life with complete faithfulness. They lived so that a culture that wrongly worshipped many gods could see the true and the living God in saving power. Because you see, my friends, the hero of the story of Daniel chapter 3 are not three friends, as important as they were. They are actually the living God, displaying himself in victory and in beauty, and showing to a wrongly worshipping culture what true worship really looks like. And if that isn't a theme for today, I really don't know what it is. So I have three points this morning. The first point is much longer than the other two. Number one, life before the furnace, verses 1 through to 15. What was life like culturally for these three friends? What was it like to be alive at this precise moment in time? Well, King Nebuchadnezzar had imposed the idolatry of self-worship on his entire empire. He had built a giant, grotesque, golden image and placed it in the plain of Jura for a festival of false worship. Verse 1 tells you that. Ninety feet high, towering over the entirety of his empire, never mind the plain. It towered like maybe the Birmingham Bull did at the recent games that were in Birmingham. And all had to fall face down under this cultural agenda of self-greatness. No one was to be excluded. All were included. Now either the image was for the chief god Marduk, or maybe the, chief, or the image was for Nebuchadnezzar himself. But it makes no difference really. The issue is that this is a festival that proclaims the self-greatness of human beings. The opening ceremony is brilliant and impressive. The cultural elite were present and the power of celebrity was overwhelming. You keep this repetition of uh, satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces. And they attend this dedication. Everybody who's anybody is there. This is a global event. And the powerful are present. And celebrity is all over the place. And the music is fantastic. And the drama is immense. Maybe it's like an Olympic opening ceremony. Maybe it's like the last night of a festival of music. Whatever music turns you on. But let's be clear. The culture is saying in its ruling capacity, you will bow down and worship. The sinister element is also present, though, because it is legally imposed on the whole empire that everybody must do this. There's no opt-out. And the threat is significant. Because if people do not fall face down, they were thrown into a furnace of blazing fire, verse 6. And this would occur immediately. No trial. No appeal. All must join in the worship of the greatness of self, which is a denial of God as God.
Calvin says that our heart, uh, the natural heart of human beings, is a continual factory of idols that seek to replace God in our lives. King Nebuchadnezzar has already shown the way. Nine years previous to this, in chapter 2, he'd come to face to face with God as Daniel had given him an interpretation of a dream. And verses 45 to 47, Nebuchadnezzar seems to acknowledge God. And yet here, nine years later, He's setting aside anything, any reference to the God. Maybe he's even opposing that God in his natural heart and saying, worship me. It is true for all humanity. Romans chapter 1 tells us, in chapter, uh, verse 21, we have exchanged the glory of the, own, of the creator God for created things. Now, you go to school, you go to work, you see social media, you're very aware of the culture in which we live. Tell me, tell me, are there not idolatries in our modern culture proclaiming the greatness of self and we all must fall down and worship them? And the danger with all of those is this. That my heart responds and says, yes, I think I might like a bit of that. A bit of idolatry never killed anybody, did it? In my own life, it ranged in the early teenage years to, f to football, sad man. It moved into its later teens where I desperately wanted approval with my peers and that became everything to me. And because I was a young Christian as a teenager, I hid my Christianity. That was not going to gain me approval. It had to be hidden. Because approval with my peers was everything. When I became a preacher, and I still think I am something of a preacher anyway, the early years was all about sermon performance. I was not interested in how people were receiving the truth. I was interested in you coming to me and saying, oh, that was a great sermon, even if it wasn't. It was an idolatry that had to be dealt with and still gets dealt with to this present moment in time. See, it's natural to our hearts to want to celebrate the greatness of ourselves. We inherited it from a man called Adam and a woman called Eve. And yet the culture of our time also has particular idols that focus on self-greatness. And that all gets imposed on us, not legally, I don't think, but certainly with influence because it's all around us. So I went to Liverpool 1 to see a friend on Friday. Nothing against Liverpool 1. I often go there and I sit and have a coffee, so I'm not having a go at Liverpool 1. But the whole place is about worship, isn't it? <coughs> Food is worshipped in Liverpool 1. And I eat there sometimes, so you know I can participate in the pleasure of that. And I went to Waterstones and one entire section was, was nothing else but recipe books. Hundreds of recipe books. I got some of them myself and the food is tasty. I bought a CD and in it uh, the singers uh, said that they hoped that in buying this CD I f would find a plaster for my soul and a place of love and solace and hope. Nothing wrong with the music. It's pleasant. I like it. But there is something absolutely verging on worship at that point. Worship, music can deliver us fully. Fashion 
I don't do fashion, said one slogan. I am fashion. In my case, <laughs> certainly not appropriate. I saw a book called Gender Swapped Fairy Tales. I was asked to support a campaign for social justice. And the toilets that I went to were ethically appropriate. And sex was depicted to sell products. One walk in Liverpool one on a Friday morning and you see the worship of self-greatness. That's what it's like to live today, isn't it? Nothing has actually changed. So what does that mean for God worshippers? In this case, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. How did they respond to their cultural time as friends together who served God? Friends together who served God. They actually don't tell us how they responded in the text. It's the intolerant culture that tells us what these three friends did not do. Verse 8. Some Chaldeans took the occasion to come forward and maliciously accuse the Jews. Verse 8. And then verse 12. Speaking to the king after all the respect and scraping and bowing. These men have ignored you, the king. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. Disloyalty. <clears throat> Disloyalty to the king. Disloyalty to the culture. Disloyalty to the people around. They are named and they are shamed by the culture. And if we choose to worship God, I have to say to you, my friends, we will fail the loyalty test that the culture expects of all people, even in our own day. We will fail that test. And in this occasion, the cultural fury represented by King Nebuchadnezzar understands what the central issue is all about. It's about worship. And so in Nebuchadnezzar, as he encourages these friends in 13 through 15 to come and worship this golden statue, <laughs> and he's furious about their unwillingness to do so, then mentions the central issue of their lives. And what God can deliver you from my hands. There you go. That's what it's all about. So I ask you a question today. What God do you think can deliver you and bring you to a perfection of human living that truly worships and serves with complete freedom what God do you think can do that? And we're all going to answer, maybe, the triune God can do that. But the answer isn't simply a theological nodding of our heads, or indeed even singing great hymns, as much as I've enjoyed them this morning. It's our lives. It's how I walk around Liverpool one. Not despising people. Not avoiding the shops and spending no money. Never having a coffee or a nice eat. Or even buying a CD, CD in my case. No, no. But still with my Christian eyes, looking all around me and saying, this is worship. Wasn't it Bill Shankly who said that football isn't about life and death? It's more important than that. Did he not also characterize Anfield as a cathedral? I'm not having a go. If you're a red, that's okay. And I hope they do well, and I really do. Coming from a blue, that is something. But it's all about worship, and the world understands that.
and the world believes its gods can deliver to some measure. But even Nebuchadnezzar knew that not even any of his gods could have saved these three men from a fiery furnace. Now, was this misguided zeal on the three friends' um, case? Well, it wasn't, was it? Uh, Exodus chapter 20 and 1 to 2 was written deep into their souls spiritually. They were men who knew that they were not to worship any other god but God and certainly none of the other gods around. And they've already shown that in chapters 1 and 2. Uh, they lived with Daniel to be uh, different in the culture that they lived in, though they served the culture. And they prayed with Daniel in chapter 2 that Daniel would understand the interpretation. You see, a life of true worship that serves God, can I say this, takes place in the private sphere, takes place in the, in the small decisions that says to God, where nobody else is looking, I'm going to read my Bible, I'm going to pray, I'm going to serve you by washing the dishes here without complaint, I'm going to, I'm going to forgive some family member whom I'm having a problem with. It's in, the, in those spheres, in the private place, that a life of true worship gets worked out. It's when we're stuck in covid not able to get out to our normal social context, that we say to our God, I want to know you here. I want to know you now. I don't want to waste all this COVID time that you've given me in your providence. I don't like it. I rail against it. I want to be in church, seeing people face to face, not on Zoom, but thankful for the Zoom that provided the opportunities to meet in the ways that it did. What's going on in the private sphere? Because, as McShane said, what a man is before God or woman in the private sphere, that's what we are. These three friends in the private sphere were men who had committed themselves to loving God and knowing this God in their lives. And how do I know that? Faced with the fiery furnace now and the fury of uh, Nebuchadnezzar, he seemed to be as hot as the furnace, they say this, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer to this question. If, God, if the God we exist we serve exists, then he is able to deliver us from the furnace, the, the furnace of blazing fire, and he can rescue us from the power of you, the king. But even if he does not rescue us, we want you to know that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden statue you've set up. There's two things about that, and then I really get to my second point. Clarity. Now they say, what you're saying is true, Nebuchadnezzar, about us. But our God is able to save us. They're answering the question, aren't they? They're looking at the fire. They see the fury of Nebuchadnezzar's face. Well, you need to be very sure of your God to say what they said. And you face things in your life situation. It's not a fiery furnace, but it's still a fiery trial to you. You're standing for Jesus. You're trying to be faithful. And it's tough. But do you believe, and do I believe, in those moments that our God is able to save us? I don't know what you're doing, says Shane and Shane as they sing, but I do know what you've already done. And he's already saved us in the person of his son. And these Jews would have known the same. They, they were the men who knew about the exodus, didn't they? They knew that God was the God who saves and delivers. And we have way more 
salvation history than they did. The children are hearing about the birth of Jesus, the, resur- the, the crucifixion of Jesus, the, the resurrection of Jesus, the ascension of Jesus. That's salvation history, isn't it? That's God saving. Clarity. That's what we need to have clarity about. That's what produces true worship, whereby not only we sing the praises of God, as right as that is, but we live lives that love him and obey him and are different. Clarity. But there's also uncertainty, isn't there? Because they go on to say that God may not save them from the fire. They know that. There's no arrogant claim here in these men to know the mind of God because they don't know all the mind of God. They know something of what God has revealed of himself. But as for the great mystery of what God is doing in his world, in his wisdom, well, they weren't claiming to know all that. Providence. God will see to it. That's what it means. But we don't know how God will see to it. So let's... I I meant to bring a big sheet of paper, and here we are, a small notebook. But here we are. Here's the knowledge of God. Let's pretend. Okay? There it is. One sheet of paper. At the bottom, you won't see at the back, but that's okay. Right in the corner, there is a small dot. That's an illustration of what we know in relation to what God knows. A small dot. Now, we do know things because the Bible tells us things about God. So we have to live within the dot. We live within the revealed word of God and the gospel of who God is. Right? We live within the dot. We don't live knowing all that God is doing in his providence. But we do know because of the dot, sorry for the illustration, that we can trust the God whom we don't know what he's doing. God is able to save us, but even if he doesn't, we want you to know, O King, we're not going to worship your gods, and we're not going to bow down to your cultural rule about what worship should be. Point number one, life before the furnace. Secondly, God with his people in the furnace to save. You see, these young men didn't hate the culture. They loved the culture that they had been brought into, though they didn't love the false worship that was going on in the culture. So there's not hatred here or angry dismissal of Nebuchadnezzar. Indeed, they are laying down their lives. Let's go with this a minute. They are laying down their lives so that God can show himself to Nebuchadnezzar and to the empire. It's an act of love. God with his people in the furnace to save. God is answering the challenge of verse 15. Who is the God who can rescue you from my power? The fire of anger of the king is so hot that he heats the furnace up seven times hotter than normal. And these helpless fools of friends are thrown into this fire, verse 20, bound by the strongest Soldiers that the king can find. The fire is so hot that it kills the men who did the throwing in. Verse 23. These fully clothed men are thrown into this furnace. Look where it gets you when you refuse to fall face down as the culture demands. Look where it gets you. It puts you in the fire.
And then the king sits in his viewing platform. This is a great point. It is amazing, isn't it? I really hope you think it's amazing anyway. And he gets the shock of his life. The king who thought he knew so much. Did we not throw three men bound into the fire? He can do his sums, he was taught. Look, I see four men not tied, walking around in the fire, walking around in the fire, unharmed. And the fourth looks like the son of the gods. Was it an angel or was it the pre-incarnate Christ? Well, you can debate that for a long time, but I think it's the pre-incarnate Christ and we'll go with that for this morning. But whatever the most high God has come and he has saved them in the fire and the king in verse 26 it's almost amazing isn't it come out Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego come out the culture is taken down the worship is nothing the golden image is never referred to it fades from view So let us be real, my friends. Yes, let us confess our struggles and how tough life is. Let us be real and say that idolatry is real for us. And we are tempted to serve the gods of this world. Yes, we are. And we do sometimes. But let us be real also and confess that the risen Christ saves from the fire of imposed false worship. Let us be real that there is freedom with Christ in the fire of serving him. There is holy intimacy that we can know with Jesus, whatever the fire ordeal we are going through this morning. Jesus went to the ultimate furnace of the cross and in complete freedom and in faith in his Father. And he came out in resurrection power unharmed. And there was nothing that the ruling power of Jerusalem or Rome could do about it. So do not fear, my Christian friend. For God says, I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. I will be with you when you pass through the waters. I will, and when you pass through the rivers, they will not overwhelm you. You will be scorched. You will not be scorched when you walk through the fire and the flame will not burn you. For I am the Lord your God. I am the Lord your God. God with his people in the furnace. I don't know what the furnace looks like for you. It's a fiery ordeal. You'd rather not be there. Ostracized at work. Maybe even lost your job. Maybe despised that you're a teenager following Jesus. And not going with all the gods of this world. But know this. You can know God, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In victory and in beauty. In the middle of it. <coughs> Thirdly and finally, the culture has to respond to the God who saves. The culture has to respond eventually. And Nebuchadnezzar has to, verses 28 to 30. Yes, they come out, verse 27. No fire hut has affected them. No hair is singed. Their robes are untouched. There is no smell of fire. And these precious servants of God, now named in nearly every verse from 19 onwards, see, not shamed by God, named as precious to him, King Nebuchadnezzar is forced to praise the Most High God. And we didn't see that one coming, did we? Praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent his angel and rescued his servants who trusted in him. They violated the king's command and risked their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god.
You see, my dear friends, what do you want for your culture around you? As I walked around Liverpool one, let's go with that for a moment, and I saw all the people milling about, all the way to shop and eat and drink and whatever else they were going to do. On one level, I felt profoundly sad with regard to all the idolatry that was obviously unsure. And I felt sad not because I hate people, but because they don't know God. True worship, the victory and beauty of knowing God. True worship knows the joy of Christ who is risen from the dead. True worship of God saves and does not enslave us. True worship has such a love for the furious culture that we lay down our lives so the culture can see the victory of Jesus and the beauty of God. True worship shows the culture that what they think is a rock is actually nothing, no matter how brilliant and impressive it may be. True worship shows that there is salvation in no one else but Jesus Christ alone. True worship shows that Christ does not destroy, but sin does. Collective true worship of friends, not simply sung, but actually lived out, produces hope in our lives. You see, the culture sees Christ in the fire with us. True worship is not a plaster for the soul. It is the filling of the soul with the love of God. And I cannot walk around Liverpool one, poor old Liverpool one, but it sticks in my head, so therefore it has to go. I cannot walk around Liverpool one and join in the self-worship of human greatness and self-indulgence if the love of God is filling my soul in Waterstones or John Lewis or any other shop. I finish with this and it's an illustration and I hope it makes it for you. In the film Chariots of Fire, two runners make their way to Paris for the 1924 Olympics. Both are chosen to run in separate events. Both are very fast runners but have very different motivations. Both, in fact, worship their way to Paris. Harold Abrahams is a Jew and feels a cultural outsider in the UK. This fuels his determination to win the 100 meters final. He has a professional trainer called Sam Massabini. There's been much training, tactics, detailed thinking. But on the eve of the final, Abrahams says this, and he exposes his heart as he does so. I have 10 lowly, lonely seconds to justify my existence. If you don't know the living God, my friends, in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, then you're going to have to spend the whole of your life enslaved to one thing, justifying your existence, creating purpose. So this talented man, who won the 100 meters final, yet lived that kind of tortured existence that he professed. Eric Liddell was a Scot who had been born to missionary parents in China. 
He had been selected to run in the 100 meters final, but discovered that the heats were on a Sunday. So Little pulled out months before the event. The film uh, shows you getting the information while he boards the boat. That's not true, historically inaccurate. He pulled out months before the event, making clear that he would not run on the Sunday. He was selected for his lesser event of 400 meters, as that was on a Thursday. It was a clear-headed decision. We could see him as a legalistic man into Sabbath rule-keeping. But that's not what's going on here. It was a worship decision because he was a man who knew the incomparable God in his life. And this incomparable God of Isaiah 40 had won his heart. And so in the film, as Abraham uh, wins his final, Little is depicted as attending church and worshipping the risen Lord. And Isaiah 40, 28 to 31, is quoted. The incomparable God. Did Little secretly wish... He was running the 100 meters and winning gold? No. Because the incomparable God had won his heart. In the film, he says something to his sister. She's concerned about the idolatry of his running. There you go. It is a film about worship. Now, he didn't actually say these words, but I think they actually summarize his life. He says to her, God has made me for a purpose, and he has made me fast. And so when I run, here we go, can you finish it? I feel his pleasure. And when he was running in church, the Christian life, worshipping the risen Lord, and when he was dying in a Chinese concentration camp as a missionary many years later, Eric Little knew that he had been made for a purpose. And when he ran faithfully and knew the living God who is incomparable, he felt his pleasure. I sat with a friend in John Lewis and had a conversation with this dear friend. It was all about Jesus, uh, though we did cover some other matters. And at that table, I have to say, without overstating it, the pleasure of God in Christ filled our souls. And that is how we will win our culture. They need to see the living God in our lives. And the victory and the beauty of true worship. Listen to Romans as I finish. For no one, none of us lives for himself, and none, none of us dies for himself. If we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or whether we die, we belong to the Lord. That's a real pleasure, isn't it? Let's stand and sing our, own, our final hymn. Thank you for bearing with me and coming with me if you did.